My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, invoking the guidance of the Holy Spirit for the officers of the courts and jurists unites us to a long, noble tradition which recognizes the sovereignty of God over all claims of sovereignty. Our very democracy is grounded in self-evident truth that all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Rights which, as John Kennedy said, do not depend on the largesse of the state, but come to us from the hand of God. I am here today to ask all of our jurists and people who work in the legal system to see their profession as a vocation, a call to serve God and humanity by working for justice. It is not easy. Today's climate of moral relativism has invaded our culture from academy to academy awards. It denies any objective truth in moral statements Moral judgments are held to be purely subjective sentiments. The hyper-individualism of our culture gives free reign to the autonomous self, unencumbered by reason. Thus, our therapeutic society values sincerity rather than truth, feeling over reason. For the radical secularist, Religion is a quirky private hobby, best filed away under multiculturalism. In reality, religion makes an indispensable contribution to our democratic way of life. And as de Tocqueville observed, without religion, the individualism of the American culture would destroy democracy. Freedom and truth are inexorably connected. Christ tells us the truth will make you free. If we jettison truth for ideology, we shall be undermining our democratic institutions. Political correctness, the fashionable fascism of the mind, would like to banish religion from the public square but the place of religion and religious convictions in public life is precisely to sustain those values that make possible a common good that is more than just a temporary political expediency motivated by personal convenience or gain. The gospel offers another path. It's said that a lawyer never asks a question unless he knows the answer ahead of time. With that in mind, we heard a lawyer asking a question in today's gospel. He asked Christ, Teacher, what do I have to do to possess eternal life? Jesus, like the Irish, answers a question with another question. What stands written in the law? How do you read? And the lawyer formulates the correct answer. You must love the Lord with your whole heart, with your whole mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus praises the lawyer's response and says, Do this and you will live. The law is meant to be life-giving. And the law of love of God and neighbor offers us eternal life. The lawyer's embarrassed that he did not cut a good figure and so posed a second question. And in so doing, he affords Jesus the opportunity to give us his great teachings in the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's quite a neutral term for us, but to the original audience, Good Samaritan was a contradiction of terms. The Samaritans were about as welcomed 
as New York Yankee fans are in Boston. It was, of course, the Mutual Admiration Society. In the previous chapter of Luke's Gospel, before the one we just heard, the Samaritans refused to let Jesus and his apostles into their village because they were headed towards Jerusalem. The apostles asked Jesus to rain fire down on the Samaritans. On the other hand, when Jesus cured the ten lepers, only the Samaritan returned to give thanks. The lawyer's seemingly simple question evokes a rather complex response. In the parable, the priest and Levite pass by their countryman who's been beaten and left for dead. The original Galilean peasant audience would have identified immediately with the victim of the crime rather than with the more aristocratic hierarchs. They would have adopted the view from the ditch. They would easily have imagined themselves lying there in the gutter, stripped, beaten, helpless, unable to move, and opening their eyes and looking up and forced to see horror of horrors, one's hated enemy as the merciful face of God. It was the worst ethnic nightmare. As the victim, unable to resist, they're forced to accept godly mercy from one regarded as beyond the pale. They would have shuddered at the thought. But once they got over the shock, then sooner or later they would come to the slow realization that sometimes it's possible to accept God's healing and forgiving mercy only after one has reached the depths of need, having been stripped of everything, including one's hates and prejudices. That's the way the first audience would have heard this shocking parable. They would have felt the great humiliation of discovering God's compassionate love in the face of the Samaritan enemy. The victim of crime would realize that accepting mercy from one regarded as an enemy would challenge him to see every person as a neighbor and to become himself a doer of mercy across any boundary of separation, hate, or prejudice. Cardinal Wright once told us about a relative of his who was a fighter pilot in World War II. His plane was shot down behind enemy lines and he was seriously wounded. He was sure that he would die in that field, surrounded by the burning carcass of his downed plane. Eventually, the pilot lost consciousness. He woke up several days later in a bed. His wounds had been dressed. To his horror, he saw on the wall of that room a large photograph of a young man in a German officer's uniform. He later learned that the German farmer and his wife who had found him cared for him. They'd found a rosary in his pocket and that made them decide to hide him. Their son was a pilot in the Luftwaffe and they had not heard from him in many months. They were praying that if their son's plane were shot down behind enemy lines, that someone would have mercy on him. The young American pilot, like the man left for dead on the road to Jericho, was shocked to find mercy where he felt it would never be found. He was forced to see a neighbor in one he considered an enemy. God's love is universal, and we are called to be a part of that love. Another striking thing about this parable is the phrase used to describe the attitude of the Samaritan. It says that he saw the wounded man and felt compassion. He felt mercy. That verb, to feel compassion, appears only twice in the Gospel. Once, it refers to Christ. And here it refers to the Good Samaritan. 
he saw, felt mercy, and approached. It's a gift to be able to see people suffering and feel empathy. The Samaritan feels compassion and shows mercy. Christ in the parable is urging us to feel compassion, to have mercy, and to draw near to be a neighbor, even to a stranger. We must come to see that whoever is in need has a claim on our love. I believe that this parable speaks to us about how believers in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts must have view the present ballot initiative on physician-assisted suicide. Mercy means caring for the dying, doing all in our power to let them die surrounded by love. This is what Mother Teresa did for many decades in the slums of Calcutta. She put the dying person on her back or put them in a wheelbarrow and took them to an old abandoned Hindu temple, cleaned them up and comforted them so that they could die surrounded by love. This is what the Samaritan does in today's gospel. And the dying man actually survives. People my age get most of their exercise by serving as pallbearers at their friends' funerals. And the first thing you read in the morning is the Irish sports page. At this moment, I have three close friends who are actively dying. The sister who was my chancellor for many years in the West Indies, a young man who had been my assistant at the Centro Católico, and one of my great students from Catholic University. The death of loved ones and friends is very emotional for all of us. Laws born of raw emotion are not good laws. Laws must protect the most vulnerable. In this case, the vulnerable are the elderly and terminally ill. The ballot initiative has more protections for the people who facilitate premeditated suicide than it has for the person being killed by the lethal drugs. Some people feel that it's a government intrusion to prevent suicide. But the task of the government is not to encourage, but to discourage suicide. Today's New York Times tells us that suicide has now surpassed combat deaths in our armed forces. Legalizing suicide sends a terrible message to the public. And this particular legislation depends on a very often inaccurate forecasting of death and the lack of safeguards around the capacity of the individual to make a free decision in a state of depression. All of this could take place without ever notifying the family or consulting with the palliative care or hospice expert. That is neither dignified nor compassionate. The gospel teaching could not be clearer. Please don't wait for a Harvard professor to produce a long lost Coptic papyrus fragment that has the Samaritan whispering in the ear of the dying man, here, swallow these hundred tablets. Compassion must be about caring for the sick and the dying, about making the best palliative and hospice care possible available to all. Anything else is an ugly distraction. In Genesis, the Lord says to Cain, where is your brother? Cain, who has killed his brother, says, am I my brother's keeper? Well, the priest and Levite in the parable who walked by the dying man obviously thought that they were not their brother's keeper. There are some who would say that if you pass by this bad law, 
doesn't affect me. The truth is, the correct answer to Cain's question is yes, we are our brothers and sisters keeper. We do have a responsibility to watch out and care for one another. And if the government is going to start facilitating suicide, it's everybody's business. Just ask the people from the disabilities community who along with the Mass Medical Association, suicide prevention groups, and many rabbis, ministers, and hospice care workers who oppose this flawed legislation. Oregon has one of the highest suicide rates in the country. They should not be our model. Nor do we want the suicide tourism that exists in Switzerland today. Our task is to defend the gospel of life. Do this and you will live, Jesus says. We are here to build a civilization of love where people are more important than money, where our kindness and concern does not stop at the picket fence around our lives. The civilization of love is to reflect God's universal love for all of us. It's built upon the truths that uphold our social order, the dignity of each and every human being made in the image and likeness of God, the need to con defend the common good and to seek the hard truths that will truly make us free. St. Thomas More, who models such faith and courage, is the patron of your noble profession. We can only admire the tribute he paid by his life and death to the truth that morality cannot be separated from God, nor law from morality. He was truly a man of the commandments and the beatitudes, a man for all seasons, a man for our time. For perhaps better than any other, he showed us how we can integrate a full legal professional and family life with a personal life of prayer and deep principles. And so in this red mass, whose color links the blood of martyrdom to the robes of justice, we gather in this holy place to invoke the power of God that the Holy Spirit may guide all of you in your work so that you too may be steadfast proponents of all that is right, good, and just. May your faith light the path of reason and bring you joy and satisfaction as you work for a more just world, a society that does not fear truth as an unwelcome intruder, but seeks truth as the basis for our freedom. Together, we are called to evangelize the culture and build a civilization of love one brick at a time. God bless you.